what I've learned is that the reason you get rejected by VCs are typically the reasons that your company might fail. The truth of the matter is that, you know, investors are not your friends. Like these people are there. It's there's a binary outcome that goes along with that, too. And you got to have their money back in three to five years. We struggled very hard for four years where no one wanted to invest. The last round we raised was uh, 486 million euro. So a pretty, pretty large amount. And um, and the first round we raised was uh, 1.6 million euro. And uh, the level of stress and the level of uh, uncertainty was not much higher for the last round versus, you know, the, the, the first round we, uh, we, we, we had. That was incredibly difficult, right? Uh, the, the notion of venture capital was very nascent um, in South Africa at the time. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fintech Leaders, coming to you from New York City. I'm your host, Miguel Armasa, and I'm a co-founder of Gilgamesh Ventures, a venture capital fund that backs early stage entrepreneurs in the US, Canada, and Latin America. If you enjoy this conversation, I invite you to leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your show so more people can learn about fintech leaders. In this special episode, I bring you a curated selection of the best lessons, stories, and candid reflections about raising venture capital. You will hear directly from some of the strongest fintech entrepreneurs around the world spanning across four continents. From the skyscrapers of New York City through the vibrant landscapes of Cape Town up to the lively streets of Mexico City over to the cafes of Paris and all the way to the heart of Bogota. The founders featured in this episode have built and continue building revolutionary companies, many of them multi-billion dollar enterprises. To get there, they've been successful at raising venture capital from some of the most respected investors in the world. In this episode, they reveal the lessons learned and pass on valuable insights from their experiences. And since this episode is coming out on July 4th, I can assure you that many of them are leaving their own version of the American dream. So whether you're an aspiring entrepreneur just starting your journey or a seasoned founder facing new challenges, I hope you find valuable takeaways in this episode. First up, we have Alex Proth co-founder of Conto, one of the largest fintechs in all of Europe that has raised over $700 million and reached a $5 billion valuation in 2022. He advises founders to raise money only when they're ready and to have a clear plan, knowing potential investors, setting a time frame, and determining a suitable amount to raise. After the process, one should return focus to operations and growing the business. And it's, it's funny because the last round we raised was uh, 486 million euro. So a pretty, pretty large amount. And, um, and the first round we raised was uh, 1.6 million euro. And uh, the level of stress and the level of uh, uncertainty was not much higher for the last round versus, you know, the, the, the first round we, uh, we, we, we had. So of course, lots of things, uh, changed in, in between the, the company, uh, probably, you know, myself and, and then my co-founder as well, Steve, but, uh, and, and, and the market, but, uh, but yeah, so to, to get back to your question, um, I think the main, the main thing is, um, to be you know, to be raising money when you are ready and to be clear on, you know, what you're raising money for um, is the key. And uh, and trying to make sure you, uh, you know, you manage and own the, the process and the timeline is, is very key. And I think it's uh, depending on the context, depending on the, you know, the how sexy your company or business is, it can be, you know, easy or, or not so easy. But uh, but there's definitely a huge difference versus, uh, you know, just taking some calls and uh, saying yes, yes, and, you know, 
sharing some data and then praying for the investors to come to come back to you. That's uh, you know that that happened to us a couple of times, and of course that's not the best uh, way to to raise uh, money. If on the other hand you uh, you know you want to raise X million euro, this is your plan, and you already know a couple of investors could be interested, and you tell them, look, I'm going to be raising money in April. Uh, I want to raise 10 million. I want to work for six weeks on you know talking with a different number of parties. But at the end of the six weeks, I really want to make sure I'll take one of the offers, the best offer, uh, or let's say the most interesting offer, and then move back to you know being 100% focused on the operations and on building and growing my business. Up next, we hear from Alloy co-founders Laura Speakerman and Tommy Nicholas. They have raised around $200 million and the company was recently valued at $1.5 billion. But they're not afraid to share that their success came after years of struggle and countless of rejections. They are also big believers in luck, but argue that founders can create their own luck by being open to various opportunities and networking in the industry. We got rejected a lot. Um, it's a good reminder. We, I think it's it's because things look, have looked really good since then. I talked to a lot of entrepreneurs who have similar businesses, right? Like selling software into financial institutions, for example, our infrastructure and to work out, you know, alloys just how we want to be. I'm like, that's, it's awesome. And I'm super flattered by it, but also we struggled very hard for four years where no one wanted to invest. So don't, don't do what we did for five years. Um, but yeah, we, we, we had a hard time in fundraising. I think the world was really different back then. So we, we benefit now from a ton of luck and a ton of sort of tides just shifting in our direction. I can't overstate that enough. Luck, I think is a huge part of it. So there's going to be a lot out of your control, but there is sort of this idea, which I believe that you can create your own luck by saying yes to things, by being open to a variety of possibilities so um that might mean you know i think especially for for women that tends to mean network like crazy right your first three customers five customers if you're b2b are going to come from your network and so you don't want to spend all your time at cocktail parties and you no know, time building but you do want to understand the landscape well enough to know that if there is someone who's going to be asking for a platform like yours and in the market that they know that you exist I think one of the things that pissed me off for a long time was when people would complain about how easy it is to raise money. I remember in 2018, people being like, oh, it's so easy for these founders to raise money. I was like, it's impossible for me to raise money. So I don't know who you're talking about, but it's, I'm spending all of my time. I mean, Laura and I from 2016 to 2017 pitched a hundred investors and got a hundred no's. Now we had raised a great seed round from the infinitely patient and amazing primary ventures and a few other folks here in New York and Jenny Fielding had, had put us in tech stars. And, but we had, we made a mil, we made a million and a half dollars last like two and a half years or something. Maybe we raised another $250,000 or something. Oh no, that's definitely true. This, this, an angel investor. I just can't remember if this, if she's like public that she did that, but like we had an angel investor write us like a hundred thousand dollar check. I think it was a scout check, but I don't even know. I've, I've, I've never even looked into this in like 2017 that actually I think we would have gone to business, go out, gone out of business if she hadn't written that check. Like that's the <laughs> level of like needing money that we were in. We stopped paying ourselves. We had no savings. So it wasn't like stop paying yourselves and live off savings. It was like stop paying yourselves and like see if your landlord notices you didn't pay rent type situation. Now we hear from Itai Damti, CEO of Unit, a company that's raised almost 170 million. Ita is also a repeat founder, and he stresses the importance of paying attention to VC feedback, as rejections often highlight potential risks that could lead to failure. He also reminds founders that execution and de-risking will determine a company's success, not investors. I will uh, really respect investors and say that they are great. M many of them are great at what they're doing. And what I've learned is that the reason you get rejected by VCs are typically the reasons that your company might fail. It's an obvious statement, but there's signal in every VC conversations. Of course, we want to hope that we understand something about the world that they don't. And 
you, you need to be a bit arrogant and be able to take a punch sometimes to be a founder, an effective founder. Um, but I think people should listen to the feedback and people should, instead of ignoring the feedback or, or dismissing it, people should act and learn how to answer and, and really take into account the risks that VCs are flagging because they typically tend to be the risks that you fail eventually as a founder. Um, so that's one thing I learned. Um, we have an incredible set of investors today. We raised 170 million to date from Insight, Excel, Better Tomorrow Ventures, and and um, many other funds and, and long tail of um, angel investors, it's more than 60 right now. And um, I would say that despite my love and appreciation for our investors and their support to date, I actually don't think that investors make or break companies. I don't think that prospective investors make or break companies. I don't think that existing investors make or break. They're helpful. But eventually what makes or breaks companies is execution and de-risking. And when you enter execution mode, remember what your VCs that passed on you told you when they passed, because this is going to be the set of things that you'll need to de-risk as you put your head down and execute. And so we switched very um, quickly from fundraising mode to execution mode every time we raise money. And we typically don't speak to investors between the rounds because we have a company to build. It's a very, very difficult type of business to build. If you don't put your head down and just focus on it, this is um, a dangerous concept. If you think that there's a investor you should speak to and build a relationship with, um, sometimes it's an illusion. Sometimes you just need to focus on the risk in the business because, you know, Ben Graham, the investor said that in the short term, the market is a voting machine, but in the long term, it's a weighing machine, right? So you might get hype, you might get dollars today, but you're building a machine that needs to be weighed against market factors and trends and competition in the long term. And if you don't learn how to do it effectively, regardless of how flattered you feel by investor conversations, regardless of how you feel about progress, you're not going to build the right machine. And I think this is what founders should focus on. Investors are just a um, friendly and helpful backer and, and supporter in what is otherwise your lonely journey as a founder and you need to internalize it and just accept the loneliness and just do it next up breen mcnulty rojas co-founder of habby a company that's raised over 300 million dollars she shares some tough moments and why breen believes that while board members and investors can be helpful at later stages Early on, it's challenging for outsiders to significantly influence the company's trajectory. There are moments in building a company that are really, really difficult and emotional. Uh, like when we had just really started to get some momentum at Hobby and COVID hit and we were under pressure from some of our investors to cut overhead by 30%. At that moment, our only overhead effectively was payroll. And we had just convinced all of these people, really smart, amazing people who we really loved and were happy to have, to leave their steady jobs at the beginning of a pandemic and trust our vision and join Hobby. So we were really loath to do anything there. Ultimately, what we ended up doing, by the way, is we offered everybody the option to anonymously vote to cut their salaries or to have us do salary cuts. 100% of the company opted to take salary cuts. And actually, a couple of the leaders came to us on their own and asked if Sebastian and I were taking larger salary cuts because they would do the same if we were. So we made through. We made it through fine. We raised the A. We increased everyone's salaries even more. And I think it was a really meaningful bonding experience for the company. But anyway, that was really, really stressful for a good reason. As you go through this crazy kind of like fundraising cycle and you see everything in the news and there's all of this whirlwind of kind of PR, I think it's really important to just like keep your feet on the ground and take one foot in front of the other and just build and know that dollars are green no matter who they're from. And you just need to keep serving the ultimate client in the best way that you can and things will go from there. At the very early stages, it's hard for anyone outside of the team to be that helpful. Uh, I feel extraordinarily lucky as does Sebastian that we love our board and we find our board to be very, very, very helpful. Genuinely not just saying that. Um, in a lot of, of decisions that we make, some related to personnel, some related to strategic direction, some related to just like on the ground kind of knowledge and connections like SoftBank in Mexico, for example, has been tremendously useful as we open up that market. 
Uh, but I think in the very early stages, it's really hard for people to, to make a difference. Coming up, Tatleho Mafai, co-founder of Yoko, a company that's raised close to $200 million. He recounts the struggles of raising venture capital in South Africa almost a decade ago, back when there was barely any tech funding in the continent. As a silver lining, the tech slowdown of 2022 and 2023 is nothing new for African startups. Having already grappled with funding issues, Atlejo argues they are very well equipped to handle market crutches. Then you also had the topic of capital and, 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 and being able to, um, to actually finance the company. And that was incredibly difficult, right? Uh, the, the notion of venture capital was very nascent um, in South Africa at the time. Um, the other dimension in South Africa is that capital is also highly concentrated. Um, this is just coming out of sort of the apartheid sanction uh, times. Like uh, whether we like it or not, uh, those dynamics uh, still exist in terms of you know how capital is structured and, and concentrated. So um, we uh, had to get pretty smart about being able to raise uh, money from abroad. And in those early days, it was very much, you know, angels and family offices. And, you know, we syndicated them into a, a company called the Yoko Investor Company. And that's basically how we founded ourselves in the early days before we did our first institutional round in 2017. Folks who raised in 2021 um, and... Uh, aren't able to strengthen the balance sheets in some form um, over the course of this year and through to the next, um, things are going to get quite difficult uh, going into next year from a runway perspective. And yeah, my hope is that, uh, you know, uh, leaders um, are um, uh, being prudent, are really beginning to hunker down on the topic of profitability um, and uh, you know, really becoming ROI orientated, um, and can really you know oh, do whatever they need to in order to weather the storm because yeah, it's not going to be an easy time. But you know what? Um, we all know that uh, it's during these times that uh, great organizations are built, great models are built, great ways of working and are uncovered, just sort of coming out of constraint. And um, I would say. One thing that's interesting about our part of the world, and I remember having a conversation uh, with um, uh, with one of our investors about this, is that you know we 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 we've had to deal with uh, um, funding challenges uh, from the onset, right? It's nothing new to us, um, and you know, have learning how to navigate that, being smart and being deft. So. I think that's the one good thing is that uh, I think for a lot of these companies, um, you know, the the, the crunch um, in 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 the capital markets is is nothing new. The opportunity in Africa is also the challenge, um, and the the investors who can wrap their minds around this um, have a bit of patience. Well, over the long term, uh, reap. Uh, significant rewards. Now we get to hear from Jorge Combe, co-founder of DD360, a company that was bootstrapped with no outside funding for many years, but that later was able to raise a $91 million Series A. Jorge shares the advantages of bootstrapping and emphasizes that this approach imparts discipline, forces prudent spending, and encourages reinvestment for growth. In fact, they've had over 70 months of profitability since getting started. Bootstrapping, for the people that are not familiar with the term, it means that you don't raise equity. So you try to do it with whatever you want, with whatever you have, I'm sorry. I think that that was the traditional way of entrepreneurship in the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s. So nobody had money, no? So there was not such a thing as venture capital. Potentially, there were some dreamers and people and, and very little funds in, in Silicon Valley. But I think that for the rest of the world, everything was bootstrapped until there was this uh, angel and then the VCs, which put a little bit of distortion within the system because right now a person only with a PowerPoint and potentially some metrics, they can raise, I don't know, $5 billion with a 20, 25 cap valuation. I think that that didn't exist. Or at least Martin and I, we were 
extremely naive. We didn't even know that this was possible. No, see, if you could have told us that we could raise $5 million with a PowerPoint, for sure we would have tried to do that. No, but we were very naive. We didn't know that that was possible. So one of the things that we did is that uh, we began with our means. So we didn't have any money. So we found the DD3 with 50,000 pesos. That's all the money that we have put between us into the company. And, but we put a lot of work and really, really long hours. I think that by bootstrapping the company, one of the things and just reinvestment, no? So we haven't taken any money out of the company. So we have just a salary, a regular salary, but we don't take any money out. We reinvest everything. And I think that that gives you a lot of discipline because you think you, you need to spend whatever you have into the, into the register. So if you don't have any extra money, you cannot do things, but the discipline also gives you a lot of, a lot of, um, it, a different attitude towards how you spend the money and the capex. And that it gave us and gave us a, the opportunity to be extremely prudent in the way that we hire, for example. So we were five people for the first few years because we couldn't afford more people. Then we were 10, then we were 15. So whenever you see all the hype that, that happened within the venture capital, when, whenever you take a look at some of these valuations where they're going to be losing money for the first 10 years, and then they see, well, yeah, but whenever I reach a level that is, I don't know what, then I'm going to be profitable. We don't understand that. So I think that it was, for us, it was extremely lucky, bootstrapping and how naive we were with entrepreneurship. We have been profitable in, for the company since we founded the company for every single month. So right now we have like 70 or so 80 months that consecutive profitability within the company and just growing and reinvesting. We think that we, that we have put a discipline that we need to reinvest and continue growing the company. And that is the only way that it can survive in the future. Next, we hear from Kurt Lin, co-founder of Pinwheel. He believes that fundraising is about building long-term relationships with partners who genuinely understand and believe in your vision. And once you find that true believer who can become a strong evangelist for your company, grab onto that person because they will help bring others on board. A lot of the advice you get, broadly speaking, is fairly accurate, which is that this is a long-term thing. Right. Like, uh, someone that I'm close to once told me, you know, jobs are short careers are long. And so you need to build relationships. Right. And it's really interesting because I think a lot of folks have, whether behind closed doors, or I think this happens less publicly will equate, uh, fundraising to dating, right. Where it's, it's a lot of the times you will feel a connection with a partner who you can tell just gets it. Right. And if they don't, that's okay, but don't waste your time with someone who, who doesn't get you, doesn't get the vision, doesn't really see where this is going because you, especially early on, you believe it, right? All those early stage bets are just, it's like 99% team and founder, right? And well, founders, I should say, and generally a lot less so, you know, what is the like really special thesis that they have? Because the reality is inevitably the strategy is going to change, the market's going to change and it's about whether the team can operate themselves to a place of success, not can they, do they have the best idea of the world, right? I think, I think it, it's a John Doerr quote that is, um, uh, ideas are meaningless, execution is everything, right? And it really is true. And so uh, the advice that I always try to give folks is early on in the process, right? Just like with dating, when you find someone who gets it, you'll know there's a, there will be a connection there. You can tell they're leaning in and they, they want to learn more. They want to support you. And there are folks who will, won't. and you focus on the ones that do, and you really only need one, right? Because if you find one person who can be that true evangelist supporter, they will go out of their way to bring in the other folks behind them. Right? So in most contexts, that's like a lead investor. But even if you're not actually doing a real round, having one really a true believer as an angel who knows other angels, they will vouch for you. And then you have this network effect of social proofing, right? You see that one domino to fall and the rest of it starts to come through. And so for the folks who are, especially those who have had more trouble on the fundraising side of things, that's why I always say is like, just, you got to find those real believers and just find that first one. And the rest will suddenly start to fall. Finally, Rob Petrozo, co-founder of Rally who reminds startup founders that while good relationships with investors are important, they aren't necessarily there to be your friends. Their ultimate goal is a binary outcome. They expect a return on their investment within a certain time frame. This is not to knock VCs. We have, I'm lucky. We have really good investors on our cap table. And we've always had people that like, 
that I've always looked at as like mentors. But I think a lot of things, something that like a lot of people get wrong and we didn't early is that the truth of the matter is that, you know, investors are not your friends. Like these people are there. It's, there's a binary outcome that goes along with that too. And you got to have their money back in three to five years. You know what I mean? Like they're not looking to hang out with you. Well, that's all folks. Thanks for tuning in. And I hope you enjoyed this amazing special episode on raising venture capital with some inspiring fintech leaders from all over the world. If you want more interviews, make sure to subscribe, follow, and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your shows. It helps and truly means a lot. And if you have any suggestions or thoughts about the show, just drop me a line on Twitter or LinkedIn. Signing off till next week, I'm your host, Miguel Armasa.